because it's a great film. The OA one to hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the show, Faith Perlow presents Ask a Teacher. After that, we begin a two-part American story, Rappaccini's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. But first... 2024 is just hours away. Before the world welcomes a new year, we remember some of the influential people who died in 2023. We start with U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. O'Connor died on December 1st. She made history in 1981 when she became the first woman appointed to the United States' highest court. She served in the position for 25 years. The judge was considered a centrist, or moderate, in her court opinions. She was often considered the swing vote on major issues such as abortion, affirmative action, and voting rights. Sandra Day O'Connor was born in El Paso, Texas in 1930. She grew up on a large cow farm there. The young Sandra was an excellent student and entered Stanford University in California when she was 16, earning a degree in economics. She went on to study law at Stanford. She graduated in the top 10% of her class in 1952. President Ronald Reagan nominated her to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1981. In announcing his choice, he described the judge as a person for all seasons. American President Joe Biden spoke at her funeral. He called her a daughter of the West and a pioneer in her own right. He praised her for seeking, in his words, equal justice under law her whole life. O'Connor died from problems linked to the disease dementia and a lung infection. She was 93 years old. The world also said goodbye to former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who died November 29th. He was 100 years old. The German-born Jewish refugee served as the U.S. top diplomat under two presidents, Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford. He won praise and severe criticism in the U.S. and around the world. Kissinger helped restore ties between the United States and China. He also negotiated the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. American former First Lady Rosalind Carter died on November 19th. She was the closest advisor to her husband, former President Jimmy Carter. She served as First Lady from 1977 to 1981. She advocated for better mental health care and help for caregivers in millions of American families. Overseas, she fought disease, mass hunger, 
and the abuse of women and girls. She continued humanitarian work with her husband for 40 years following their time in the White House. The couple had been married for 77 years when Rosalind Carter died at the age of 96. Others from the world of politics who died this year include former Italian Premier Silvio Berlusconi, former Pakistani leader Pervez Musharraf, and former Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. The world also lost cultural leaders in 2023, including the so-called Queen of Rock and Roll. American singer Tina Turner died in May at the age of 83. The entertainer teamed up with husband Ike Turner for a series of hit records and live shows in the 1960s and 70s. Ike was abusive and beat Tina. She left the marriage and returned as a solo artist with a best-selling album, Private Dancer, in 1984. How do we say farewell to a woman who owned her pain and trauma and used it as a means to help change the world, actor Angela Bassett said in a statement. Bassett played Turner in the 1993 movie, What's Love Got to Do With It? Turner sold more than 150 million records worldwide and won 12 Grammys. The performer was voted, along with Ike Turner, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991 and individually in 2021. Turner's life story was made into a movie and Broadway musical. Mick Jagger of the music group The Rolling Stones called Turner inspiring, warm, funny, and generous in an Instagram post. And he wrote that Turner helped me so much when I was young, and I will never forget her. Several Nobel Prize winners died this year, including Japanese writer Kenzaburo Oe. The Nobel Literature Laureate wrote darkly poetic novels based on his childhood memories from Japan's post-war occupation. He also wrote from his experiences as the parent of a disabled son. Oe died on March 3rd at the age of 88. And the world lost its oldest resident in 2023. French religious worker, or nun, Lucille Randon, died at home in southern France a few weeks before her 119th birthday. Sister Andre, as she was known, was born in the town of Alais, southern France, in 1904. The Gerontology Research Group, which confirms details about people thought to be 110 or older, listed her as the oldest known person in the world after the death of Japan's Kane Tanaka, aged 119, in 2022. Sister Andre was also one of the world's oldest survivors of COVID-19. She tested positive for the coronavirus in January 2021, shortly before her 117th birthday. She showed so few signs of the virus that she did not even realize she was infected. News media around the world reported her survival. In April last year, she was asked about her exceptional longevity through two world wars. 
Sister Andre told French media, Working makes you live. I worked until I was 108. She was also known to enjoy a daily glass of wine and chocolate. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Hi there. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question about the words change and vary. Hello, teacher. I'm Ali, and I live in Mashhad, Iran. What is the difference between change and vary? I'm keen on knowing how American people use vary in different forms in daily conversations. Thank you, Ali. Thanks for writing to us, Ali. Here is the first major difference between the word change and the word vary. Only one of them is a noun and a verb. Change is that word. You can change your opinion, for example. That's change as a verb. You can also have a change of opinion. That's change as a noun. Very is more narrow in meaning. It means to make a partial change in something or to diversify something. Sometimes change and vary are synonyms. Let's look at each one more closely. While change can be either a noun or a verb, we will compare the verbal meanings and uses to vary. It can be used in a lot of different situations and can be a synonym for many other verbs like transform, exchange, switch, or alter. Change meanings range from making a difference or altering something particular to completely transforming or replacing something. Many schools are changing the college application requirements in response to the ending of affirmative action. Water changes from a liquid to a solid when it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Change can also mean making a slight modification in something, to switching or making a shift from one thing to another. The leaves change colors every autumn. Emma changed her shirt because she spilled something on it. Derek changed his money from dollars to euros when he went to France. Andre's accent changed after he moved to the big city. Now let's look at very. Very is a verb. It can mean to make a partial change or to differentiate between items by size, amount, or degree. I like to vary my meals with different types of grains and greens. Insects vary in size from large to very small. It can also mean to show or experience a change. The night sky varies depending on the Earth's rotation and orbit around the sun. Interest rates vary due to how the economy is. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Ali. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. Now, American Stories.
Our story today is called Rappaccini's Daughter. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. We will tell the story in two parts. Here is Kay Gallant with the first part of our story. Many years ago, a young man named Giovanni Guasconti left his home in Naples to study in northern Italy. He rented a small room on the top floor of a dark and ancient palace. Long ago, the building had belonged to a noble family. Now, an old woman, Signora Lisabetta, rented its rooms to students at the University of Padua. Giovanni's room had a small window. From it, he could see a large garden that had many plants and flowers. Does the garden belong to you? He asked Signora Lisabetta one day. Oh, no, she said quickly. That garden belongs to the famous doctor, Giacomo Rappaccini. People say he uses those plants to make strange kinds of medicine. He lives in that small brown house in the garden with his daughter Beatrice. Giovanni often sat by his window to look at the garden. He had never seen so many different kinds of plants. They all had enormous green leaves and magnificent flowers in every color of the rainbow. Giovanni's favorite plant was in a white marble vase near the house. It was covered with big purple flowers. One day, while Giovanni was looking out his window, he saw an old man in a black cape walking in the garden. The old man was tall and thin. His face was an unhealthy yellow color. His black eyes were very cold. The old man wore thick gloves on his hands and a mask over his mouth and nose. He walked carefully among the plants, as if he were walking among wild animals or poisonous snakes. Although he looked at the flowers very closely, he did not touch or smell any of them. When the old man arrived at the plant with the big purple flowers, he stopped. He took off his mask and called loudly, Beatrice, come help me. I am coming, father. What do you want? answered a warm young voice from inside the house. A young woman came into the garden. Her thick, dark hair fell around her shoulders in curls. Her cheeks were pink, and her eyes were large and black. She seemed full of life, health, and energy as she walked among the plants. Giovanni thought she was as beautiful as the purple flowers in the marble vase. The old man said something to her. She nodded her head as she touched and smelled the flowers that her father had been so careful to avoid. Several weeks later, Giovanni went to visit Pietro Baglioni, a friend of his father's. Professor Baglioni taught medicine at the university. During the visit, Giovanni asked about Dr. Rappaccini. He is a great scientist, Professor Baglioni replied, but he is also a dangerous man. Why? asked Giovanni. The older man shook his head slowly. Because Rappaccini cares more about science than he does about people. He has created many terrible poisons from the plants in his garden. 
He thinks he can cure sickness with these poisons. It is true that several times he has cured a very sick person that everyone thought would die. But Rappuccini's medicine has also killed many people. I think he would sacrifice any life, even his own, for one of his experiments. But what about his daughter? Giovanni said. I'm sure he loves her. The old professor smiled at the young man. So, he said, you have heard about Beatrice Rappuccini. People say she is very beautiful. But few men in Padua have ever seen her. She never leaves her father's garden. Giovanni left Professor Baglioni's house as the sun was setting. On his way home, he stopped at a flower shop where he bought some fresh flowers. He returned to his room and sat by the window. Very little sunlight was left. The garden was quiet. The purple flowers on Giovanni's favorite plant seemed to glow in the evening's fading light. Then someone came out of the doorway of the little brown house. It was Beatrice. She entered the garden and walked among the plants. She bent to touch the leaves of a plant or to smell a flower. Rappuccini's daughter seemed to grow more beautiful with each step. When she reached the purple plant, she buried her face in its flowers. Giovanni heard her say, Give me your breath, my sister. The ordinary air makes me weak. And give me one of your beautiful flowers. Beatrice gently broke off one of the largest flowers. As she lifted it to put it in her dark hair, a few drops of liquid from the flower fell to the ground. One of the drops landed on the head of a tiny lizard crawling near the feet of Beatrice. For a moment, the small animal twisted violently. Then it moved no more. Beatrice did not seem surprised. She sighed and placed the flower in her hair. Giovanni leaned out of the window so he could see her better. At this moment, a beautiful butterfly flew over the garden wall. It seemed to be attracted by Beatrice and flew once around her head. Then the insect's bright wings stopped and it fell to the ground dead. Beatrice shook her head sadly. Suddenly, she looked up at Giovanni's window. She saw the young man looking at her. Giovanni picked up the flowers he had bought and threw them down to her. Young lady, he said, wear these flowers as a gift from Giovanni Guasconti. Thank you, Beatrice answered. She picked up the flowers from the ground and quickly ran to the house. She stopped at the door for a moment to wave shyly at Giovanni. It seemed to him that his flowers were beginning to turn brown in her hands. For many days, the young man stayed away from the window that looked out on Rappuccini's garden. He wished he had not talked to Beatrice, because now... He felt under the power of her beauty. He was a little afraid of her, too. He could not forget how the little lizard and the butterfly had died. One day, while he was returning home from his classes, he met Professor Baglione on the street. Well, Giovanni, the old man said, have you forgotten me? Then he looked closely at the young man. 
What is wrong, my friend? Your appearance has changed since the last time we met. It was true. Giovanni had become very thin. His face was white, and his eyes seemed to burn with fever. As they stood talking, a man dressed in a long black cape came down the street. He moved slowly, like a person in poor health. His face was yellow, but his eyes were sharp and black. It was the man Giovanni had seen in the garden. As he passed them, the old man nodded coldly to Professor Baglioni, but he looked at Giovanni with a great deal of interest. It's Dr. Rappaccini, Professor Baglioni whispered after the old man had passed them. Has he ever seen your face before? Giovanni shook his head. No, he answered. I don't think so. Professor Baglioni looked worried. I think he has seen you before. I know that cold look of his. He looks the same way when he examines an animal he has killed in one of his experiments. Giovanni, I will bet my life on it. You are the subject of one of Rappaccini's experiments. Giovanni stepped away from the old man. You are joking, he said. No, I am serious. The professor took Giovanni's arm. Be careful, my young friend. You are in great danger. Giovanni pulled his arm away. I must be going, he said. Good night. As Giovanni hurried to his room, he felt confused and a little frightened. Signora Lisabetta was waiting for him outside his door. She knew he was interested in Beatrice. I have good news for you, she said. I know where there is a secret entrance into Rappaccini's garden. Giovanni could not believe his ears. Where is it? he asked. Show me the way. <laughs> You have just heard part one of the story called Rappaccini's Daughter. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne and adapted for special English by Donna DeSantis. Your storyteller was Kay Galland. Listen next week for the final part of our story. This is Shep O'Neill. the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.